Okay, so uh, my name is Evan Phoenix, and I am the Rubinius lead developer. And I work for Engineer working on Rubinius. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, cats, no, Rubinius today. But just so you know, just so that we're all on the same, the same footing here, I am a chronic procrastinator. <laughs> so I think I added about 20 slides just in the last you know, two hours or so. So, but that's okay. Um, what I want to happen here and what I like in every talk is for as things, as we kind of progress into topics, if you have questions, uh, raise your hand. And when I get to a, a stopping point quickly, then we'll talk about those, we'll, we'll address those questions sort of in the moment rather than waiting towards the end so that hopefully we can kind of get in a, a discussion sort of throughout the, com the, uh, the presentation then. Okay, so um, hopefully I will be tickled pink by this question. But who is unfamiliar or has never heard of Rubinius before? <laughs> all right, so two jerks and a, all right. Okay, so wow, I am, that's, that's awesome. We had, we had one, one person raise their hand. Uh, that, that makes me very happy. Um, so that means that I have two seconds to do the following slide then. I was calibrating per person, right? So, all right, let's see. Actually, let's see if this works. Nope, okay. So what is Rubinius for you, sir? Uh, <laughs> It's a, a re-implementation of uh, 1.8. Uh, we strive to do as much in Ruby as we can, and we make extensive use of testing throughout the project. Okay, we're done with that. Sweet. Um, uh, we are meta-circular-ish, um, and currently the project is slow but getting faster. Um, and I will kind of explain what I mean by meta-circular-ish as we go on. Uh, obviously, a big, huge thanks to Engineered. Uh, without them, uh, the project would not be where it is. Um, they have very graciously allowed me to essentially work on this full time. Um, and yeah, I don't, I mean, th this would still be a, a hobby project. I probably would have abandoned it for, you know, a, a Lolcats clone by now. So, so, uh, now that that's done, we're all sort of on the same footing. We all know what Rubinius is, and all of us but this gentleman are sort of familiar with where it's been. So we're going to go over really the state of things, where things are. And I've given a lot of presentations about Rubinius before, about what it is, sort of features of it. Today, we're, what I'm really going to be talking about is the thing that we've been working on for the last few months, which is really the, the, new, the new virtual machine that we've been working on um, writing. Like I said, I think we've been working on it for the last six months or so. Um, uh, we just recently uh, switched over and made it the, our main branch, so that that's the, that's the branch that everybody is using now, which is a, a, big, a big step, uh, because that means that we've gotten it back to the really close to the level of completeness that we were at before. Um, and as a lot, if you followed me or you followed sort of the discussion about the, this new branch, you know that uh, one decision we made was to, was to write it in C++. And I've gotten, I've gotten flack for that, it was fine. I would, give, I would, give, I would have given myself flack uh, because it is a sharp tool. But you know, the decision, hopefully, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk the next probably 20 slides about about that decision, about why we made that decision, um, and why I think it was actually a good decision. Um, the three big things that it gives us that we didn't have before, and partially this is because we're sort of starting from scratch and learning what we, taking what we had learned before and moving it forward, is these three things. the so type safety, organization, and architecture. I'm gonna spend a lot, uh, uh, the next few slides are about type safety and then the kind of the remainder are about the last two topics. So what is type safety? Well, that's when it actually is a duck. Not just, just sound like a duck or quack like a duck. You test that DNA and there's it's a duck, right? So what we're gonna do for these next few slides is 
uh, go over what we had before. So the previous VM was all implement, was implemented in C. We called it Shotgun, just because it, I don't know, I gave it a stupid name. And uh, the following code is so close, but not exactly what we would have before. So this is an example of some code that you would see in the, the well, old VM. I'll kind of let you read this over. Um, essentially, the idea was, given some string object, you, wanna, it, you just want to print out how big that string is. Now, this code it is a minefield. It is rife with the opportunity to spoil a wonder, otherwise wonderful day. The first place is right here, kablow. Now what happens in this case if our self argument, which is passed in, was not a string and we asked it to get its size? Well, all of a sudden, get size is expecting a string and it's, going to, it's just gonna seg fault on you right there, just right out of the gate, spoiled your day. And oh no, there's another one in here too, crap. And so this was sort of the, the, what we, the scenario that we had in the old VM, where we didn't really have the ability to express the types of things in this case. Everything was an object, and you just sort of hoped and prayed that the person knew what they were doing when they passed this in. It was sort of uh, programming by prayer instead of programming by contract. And there were, there were ways to solve this, and we did solve it in many different cases in specific, specific places we would solve it. And this is sort of, this, is the, this isn't how we solved it. This is a very quick example of, okay, well, fine, just put guards in there, right? All right, we'll make sure that it's a string, and then, you know, you get the, the size back, and make sure that that size thing is a fix num, and then do the operation. Well, if you're gonna have to go through the whole, everything, the entire code base and add these guards, you're gonna have more guards than you're gonna have actual code in the, in the code base at that point. Just because you, the ability to express what was going on is completely lost. And this was a, a really big problem because it, it made the code incredibly hard to, to really read, to really get a feel on what was going on and where potentially you'd have problems with things. And so let's do the, next, the same thing, but in the new system. So this is C++ code, and it's considerably more straightforward, especially coming from uh, with an object-oriented background here. Now we can see that a, the tiniest primer of C++ that string is a subclass of object and it's got an instance, an instance variable basically called size. And there's a method, a class, or a instance method for string called size int that goes through and calls a two int method on the size and we're, already we can see much more straightforward about the ability to organize that code. Uh, we don't, we're not cluttering up the code with guards. Uh, we're calling things as methods rather than as functions that have long prefix names. So already the code feels a lot more like something uh, that we're used to. And in addition, we, we get things, uh, too bad I don't know. In addition, we get things like we can declare actual types for things. So we see here that we've actually said that size is going to be a fixed num. And so we can bank on that to let the compiler at the front end do a lot more of our work of making sure that things are correct. Now, there are times, though, where you're going to have to take, say, an object, you're going to have to bring it in. You're going to have to, you're not going to know what, what, what thing it is. Now, and in, in, um, in C, you would just do a cast. You'd say, uh, this thing, I know that it needs to be a string. I'm just going to sort of cast it as, as such. So what we did is we added the, basically the ability to do safe casts to the system. So what we can do is we can do, we can do something like this. 
where this get an object returns just something, just object. Again, the, this, this class names have the same hierarchy as they do in Ruby. And so what we did is we added these, these functions, as, try as, and kind of, that work just the, just the way that you'd expect them to, which is, as you can see here, as I'm asking object to be a string, and if it doesn't work out, it's gonna raise an exception. And this try as, if it doesn't work out, it's gonna set it to, to null so that you can, you can actually do that as a conditional. And again, kind of works the same way. So what we've done then is we have taken this sort of model of where we had no types before. Everything was object. And we've added instead, now we've annotated everything with the ability to say, no, I need a string here, I need an array here. And then we've built, once we have that, we've allowed you to kind of escape the type system with casts that are safe. So that, you know, you want a string, okay, great, say that you want something as a string. And if it doesn't work out, great, no problem. It'll just raise an exception. Um, I should note, I didn't put this in here, that when you, when you use these casts, like if you use as, and you, it raises this, uh, a C++ exception called type error, that actually gets translated into a Ruby exception, a type error Ruby exception. So as you're, if you're going along and your VM code happens to do something where I, you, know, you passed in some, you know, say that, get an object, return an array, and the code didn't really work out, you would get a type error back in Ruby land that would say, oh, by the way, I, the VM couldn't figure out what was going on, you get a type error. So that in the previous, uh, the previous VM, you'd actually get a crash, which uh, would make it significantly harder to debug. So the big thing that hopefully you guys can see here is that now we're, now we have this ability to have the, the actual class hierarchy inside the VM mirror the class hierarchy that's in Ruby. So we've drastically reduced the sort of co cognitive dis cog the dissidence between, <laughs> between the VM and the kernel. And that has proved actually to be a really big benefit because now, as you're looking at the VM code, it's much easier to understand what's going on because you're already familiar with how those things would work in Ruby land, and we've just coded them to work the same inside the VM. Obviously, we not all of them, but the methods that we do. So that's type safety. Um, and that, that, has, uh, that has spared us a lot of, of, of grief. You know, early on in, in, the, in the project, Early on in the project, there was a lot of, of debugging, primarily by myself, that had to do with, oh no, I didn't expect this to happen, and it crashes because I'm trying to use, like I said, a number as a string or something like that. And now we get these very nice way of, of both annotating what we ex our expectations for the code and also making sure that um, when those go wrong, we get very nice, way, very graceful failures. Yes? Does your experience with the type safety and the core of the interpreter suggest that you want something that's a language for the Hmm. It's a good question. So the question was, does this, the aspect of type safety in the VM indicate it would be nice to have some kind of type safety in the entirety of Ruby? I actually, I don't, I don't think so. Um, mainly because I consider the VM sort of the, really the heavy lifting part of, of the system. And I, I, I really like the fact that, when, that it is going to do all of those kind of yucky bits having to do with really needing to know the types. And not needing to know the types is a luxury. And that's really why we're building, that's why we're trying to build Ruby. That's why we're trying to build an, an abstraction and infrastructure to get to that point so that you don't have to have the type safety parts. Um, and so I don't, I don't necessarily think so. I mean, obviously uh, the VM needs the type safety because uh, at some point you need to, you know, it, it, it needs to not just act like a string, it needs to be a string. And that's kind of where the rubber meets the road. Um, but no, I, I, guess, I guess I don't, so. In the back. Uh, 
Doesn't that apply to in some future world where you You're gonna have to speak up. Doesn't that apply to in some future world where you might want to write your PM in Ruby, like Ruby to work in Ruby, you know, you want to have a type safe in Ruby? Uh was that a question or was that a statement? I couldn't, I can tell from here. So I, I, it seems like the goal is to make the videos more Ruby over time. Uh, right. So that's kind of, so the, the, so the question was, how does this play in with the idea of eventually making more of the VM written in Ruby? Um, and this is why I kind of call that metacircular-ish. Um, you know, we, obviously we try to write a lot in Ruby, but there are, there are times, you know, like I'm basically explaining the parts that we didn't write in Ruby right now. Um, I, and so as we get closer down the road to this idea of, well, what if, what, if you, what if we're writing Ruby code that's in some way being translated, I guess, to some, you know, like C++ or C or whatever it might be, what would happen then? And the, my answer would be, who the fuck knows? I mean, I'm not, we're not at that juncture yet, so I'm not going to solve that problem until we even fathom it. Yes? I'm uh, sure if everybody's here, so you can possibly translate it back sure. there. Uh, we're, not really, we're not doing anything extra with the type safety system. What we're doing is taking Ruby's type safety and bringing it down to the C++ level. Uh, throwing a, uh, or raising a type error is Ruby's type safety. It doesn't say fault, it's it raises an error. And that's all that we're doing. We're just bringing that to the C++. I think that's a better way. Sure, yeah. So what Arrow was saying is, and that's a good way to explain it, that the idea is to, is to say, well, in Ruby, when you get something wrong, you get a type error. So let's extend that same idea to the VM to say, you know, Ruby already has the ability, you know, there are, there are methods in Ruby that do not duct type. Uh, there are a number of string methods that say, I need the argument to be a string, and if it's not a string, I will raise a type error. And in that same way, we've extended that concept all the way through to the, all the way through the VM now, so that at any point in the actual VM code where you're manipulating something, if the types don't match up, you now get this type error, so that it's sort of extended throughout the system. So let's move on. So the next thing I want to talk about here is exporting methods. So a big part of the VM is not just the ability to, uh, you know, to run the code, is the exporting of what we call these primitive operations, primitives. And they do things, they, there's sort of two spheres of primitives. The first is things that you just can't do in Ruby. A good example is fixnum add. You, you want to add three to four. There's, you have to, at some point, drop down to a lower layer to actually perform the, the integer addition. And so that's a place where you ha have to have a primitive for that. The other realm of primitives is things where uh, we have sort of isolated these, you know, typically they're tight loops. A lot of times it's copying data that we want to, we want to keep fast. And so we'll implement those as primitives. So there's these two kind of levels of where we want to have the VM provide us with the ability to run specific code. We kind of consider it sort of named code. And I'll get to why that is in a sec. So we'll go back to size. And this time we're just doing size instead of size int. And this is what it looks like inside the VM now to create a primitive. Um, before, there was this long, compli complicated process of adding things to lists and updating 12 files, and that's, those, are, that, those days are gone. Um, now, this is all you need. Um, and we have a process now in our build that will go through and find all these markers and automatically hook all, the, all this, this up on the VM side. And so now what we can do on the Ruby side is we just do something like this. And as you can see, the, the syntax for it essentially matches directly. So that now we've exported this method in the VM as a name, string size, and then we've attached it inside, the Ru inside Ruby. So now we have created this very simple bridge between the, the two sides of things. So, to pull it back in, now what we've also got is 
to add type safety on top of that. So we've got size. Let's add another primitive, this time string add. OK, great. Same thing. This time it takes an argument. No big deal. So we hooked that up in Ruby. Again, taking, a, taking an argument. But one thing that, like I said before, is that what happens when we add this type safety into it? We say, oh, hey, we've got a specific type here. Whereas in the old VM, this would have just been object other. Now we've actually said, no, 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 I need a string here. Don't, don't pass me anything else. Don't pass me number. Don't pass me an array. I need a, absolutely a string here. And so what happens when you do this? Well, it behaves exactly as you would expect it to, which is you get a nice type error. So now the primitives are able to declare their types, and the system will enforce all of that for you so that we've eliminated essentially the burden of having to maintain, the maintain this sort of master list of primitives and do all your setup uh, before, there was a lot of setup code that had to do in a primitive. You had to take things off the stack and make, make sure they're types. That's all gone. Now that it's basically handled all, f all for you directly. <coughs> so any questions on that section? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next one. Josh? Can you go back to the uh, code colleagues and the string and stuff? Yeah. Oh, this one? No, back to C++. Yeah. Um, so you took this you know, global thing, Ruby dot primitive, and then you, you call it a string size. And so you flattened out the space of the class hierarchy and the methods on them into just you know a, a bunch of scalar symbols. Yes. Um, so you started in one world where you have a, a hierarchy, which has some, you know, some rich structure to it, you know, it's decorated with a bunch of methods and places, and then you're going into another space that has an equivalent hierarchy, but to transition from one to the other, it's sort of completely flat back it, it, Did you think about how to, how to kind of repeat the hierarchy as you not from the other ones, but the flattening of it is something that was desirable? Uh, yeah, so I'll repeat the question real fast. So the question was, it seems funny, you know, I've gone, I'll, I've explained a lot about how the VM and the, and the VLAN share, both share these nice hierarchies. And essentially to export an operation from the VM to Ruby, we have, we're flattening it into this one namespace with you know, symbols, with names, and that kind of thing. And have we thought about how we how sort of integrate that? Well, you know, we, uh, the team and I talked about this a lot when I was first working on this system of automatically detecting primitives and exporting them. There was initially this discussion of, well, what if instead, you know, what if this, you know, instead of, uh, I think the first, like maybe day two, I actually had this set up so that you just did ruby.primitive and you didn't even put a name there. And what it did was actually, it generated some code that when the VM booted, it would actually go through and it would add a method called add that did X, Y, and Z uh, to actually call this thing. Um, and the reason that we decided not to do that, and I'll explain that first, is that essentially couples the VM directly to the names of See, how do I explain this? It's prob, okay. Well, there's that. Um, so, it's prob, so, <clears throat> okay. The boot process is kind of involved, is involved in this decision. So when, when the VM first boots up, we actually have our kernel um, compiled into .rbc files, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. And they're loaded one at a time, and they're allowed to basically run as normal Ruby code. 
um, that go through and open classes and add methods and do aliases. There's sort of a restricted subset of things that they can do because there's not very many methods available. But largely, they do, they're just running as, as code. And if we were to go through and want to add in sort of these things beforehand, there was no real place to do that. Our boot process is, is essentially run all these Ruby files, these, these pre-compiled Ruby files, and then you're done. And the VM exits when it's done with that. So it would have sort of, it would have broken up the, the boot process into something that we hadn't done before. So this continued to make sense. Basically having them flatten and export like this sort of made sense. I think if we were to kind of export the hierarchy, I, I don't really, I think there would be a lot more magic. I think that the worry was um, that it would be, we might obscure it even more. So I guess that doesn't probably answer the question, but that's the best I can do. So on to the next thing, method dispatch. So obviously, we're going through a lot of low-level stuff here. So I talked about this a couple of times, and obviously, this is the reason I bring it up yet again is because this is obviously the core of a Ruby implementation is how given, uh, you know, basically given a, a receiver and a method, how are you going to figure out what method to run? Well, we've got essentially three mechanisms right now. We've got what we call hierarchy lookup, which is kind of typically how people explain how method lookup works. You know, you uh, to use Dave Thomas's analogy, you start at the receiver and you go to the right for the class, and then you go up for the superclasses. So you're going to look through basically a number of, of hash tables, uh, what we call internally as lookup tables, to find uh, a method, an executable object. Well, that's extremely slow. Um, and, you know, even Alan Keyes knew that when he first did Smalltalk. You know, right off the bat, they added a, uh, a, a global cache to basically accelerate this, because a lot of times you end up calling the same thing. So we added the global cache. And then we've also added an inline cache. I, I haven't really detailed those here, um, and I can talk about them at the end if you guys want me to. But they essentially allow us to cache this sort of these three pieces of information the receiver, the method name, and the eventual destination method. So that's the first step in calling a method. Now number two is gonna be obviously the execution of it. So the way that we have it, the system set up now is every method in the system, uh, anything that is capable of being uh, executed by the VM is a subclass of a class called executable. And it provides this sort of function pointer that tells you what to do. So the VM, after it's looked it up, is basically just going to call this thing. And what that lets us do is we can basically just have every primitive that's in the system be one of these functions. So that when you go to run a method, all you're going to do is basically go, OK, I've looked it up. Go execute this thing. And the code, the, right off the bat, the destination code that you're going to be running is one of those primitives, like size, like we saw earlier, or add. So then when you want to run a Ruby method, we use sort of a this sort of specialized executor to actually make it faster. Now, and I can, I can go over this more later too, um, the idea is that in Ruby, the, the distribution of methods that take arguments is actually pretty, uh, pretty where it falls on the simple side. So you're gonna have a lot of methods that take like one argument you're gonna have a lot of that take none, take two, take three. You're actually gonna have fewer that takes, that say, like use a splat, or, and fewer that use optionals. It's not obviously zero, um, and with the advent of DSLs and stuff, we see that distribution go up, but it's still pretty good. So what we do is we basically accelerate those cases. Those really simple cases that we can, we 
hook them up inside the system so that the code to be executed right off the bat is going to reflect the argument counts of those methods so that we can make it nice and fast. And obviously, we have a slower sort of fallback case for all the, the, the more uh, exotic call uh, argument patterns. So to kind of look back on this, the, this is sort of the critical path of the whole VM, um, it, because method dispatch is the critical path. So we're going to go through, we're going to populate a message, and then we're going to call a resolver, um, what I'd call trampoline, this is just a function in here that um, happens to be set up so that the VM is able, or that uh, uh, the compiler is able to compile it. When it compiles out to machine code, it, it can actually do it as a tail call, so that that makes it even faster. And that resolver, all it does is it, the resolver is one of those three kinds of resolvers we saw. It's a hierarchy lookup, it's gonna be a global cache, or it's gonna be an inline cache. And it's gonna try and fill in the message as best it can. Well, it's not gonna, I take that back. It's gonna fill in the message, period. If it doesn't fill it in, then the system crashes. And then we're gonna call out to the executor. So the idea here is, and I've kind of gone through this path a lot, because the, the performance of, of these steps um, is so, so critical, especially in Rubinius, because with most of our methods actually implemented in, in Ruby, we hit this path vastly more than any other implementation. Just to, you know, say, oh, what's a good one? Say, um, like string percent, which is like sort of like printf, right? Um, that in, in 1.8 actually uses a printf, whereas ours uses a, a really large set of Ruby code to figure out, to parse what you needed using normal string methods and to dispatch to them. So this is really critical, really critical part. So that's why I'm kind of giving you guys the intro on it. So another critical part is once you've actually executed that Ruby code, what's the sort of the execute, what does the framing, and by framing I mean like stack frames look like? Well, what we have is we have this, these method context objects that are storing information about methods that are run, and they're chained together with references. So uh, they're, they're what you, what Lisp originally called this idea of a spaghetti stack. So you you create a method context object and it essentially just points to the person who sent, sent to it. It's, a, it's not organized like a C stack. It doesn't have any, any, anything implied with memory addresses or anything like that. It just basically says, this is my sender. When you're done, go back to him. Um, and this, this setup uh, is very easy to implement just right off the bat because you know, they're just going to be garbage collected objects that the VM knows how to manipulate and read. But obviously, if we're, execute, if we're doing, running a lot of Ruby code, the speed that these things can be created is critical. Um, when, when, you first, when we first implemented this, and this is true of all the, uh, the small talks too, when you first implement a really naive version of this, you find that something like 80% of the objects allocated in the system are just method contexts because Everything you do is going to be creating one of these objects. So you really need to figure out the fastest possible way of doing this. And a, a huge amount of the research in VM design actually is related to this singular concept of how to create these space to represent my context information as quickly as possible and how do I get rid of it as quickly as possible. So I'm going to explain how we do that in Rubinius. So what we do is we kind of, um, we put them in for a lack of a better word, a ghetto. There's a con special memory of that only contexts live in. That's the only thing that can live in this very special section of memory. And what we do is if you observe what happens, you find that the execution of Ruby code, even though we, 
even though we've not restricted ourselves to being allocated to, to calling ourselves on a stack, it actually follows a stack for the most part. You're going to call a method, it's going to do something, you're going to return. Uh, you're going to call a method, do something, it's going to return. So if you were to model that, you'd see that it just sort of bounces up and down, right? And so we can exploit that pattern to make the ability to allocate and deallocate very quickly. So what we get is we get a section of memory that looks something like this. We're just going to start allocating from the top and we're going to go down. And this current is where the next one will go. And then what we get, though, is Rubinius has the ability and um, it has the ability both as called and implied to reference a context. So a good idea of where it's implied is if you create a block. If you create a block, you're implying that the context that that block was created in needs to be saved, right? So if uh, you need all the locals that were there, you need to know what the, the value of self was in, all that case, in that case. So you need to retain that. Even if, even if someone returns, that needs to be remembered because those blocks could, will continue to live on. So we, what we do is we have this context bottom that says what is the, the lowest in, on this graph, the lowest context that's actually been referenced by someone that someone's created a block with, typically. And then what we do is we save all those. And then we continue to kind of fill in the bottom. So what you get is, and this would have been a great animation, but uh, you get essentially a stack that starts at zero, and it starts to fill, and then it starts to come back. It starts to fill. And as things get referenced, this starts to move down. The top stays here. So essentially, this keeps moving down, and we kind of bounce up and down until it starts to get all the way full, and then we basically just go off and we do a garbage collection. And this, this allows us to essentially turn this context creation into the same thing that would be used to create a stack frame in C, which is essentially just uh, adding a fixed offset to a pointer. You're just going to say, okay, I know that this needs, thing needs 112 bytes or whatever it might be. I'll just add that and fix it and then go on to the next thing. And so that frees our garbage collector from having to manage probably 90% of the actual method context they're created. This is another quickie little diagram that kind of shows the chain. Um, these aren't contiguous in memory. They're just sender to sender to sender. What you can see is you get this sort of mixed mode of things. We've got normal method context for running a method. These block contexts are created to run a block. Native method contexts are created when you're actually calling out to C code, which we're going to talk about next. So it, this ends up being fairly linear, and we exploit that to make it fast. So what we've got these native method contexts in there. So what are those? Let's talk about those for a second. So early on in the project, the decision, the decision was made that, well, you know, we're writing this in C. It would be a real shame if we couldn't run all of those extensions that are out there today. And so we decided we really should try as much as possible to be able to run you know, all those extensions. So again, we're talking about this little method context here. So, and the reason is that C, for, especially for a lot of things, continues to be the standard. You, know, you see a lot of um, really important pieces of functionality in the Ruby community implement, implement as extensions. Um, there are currently 138 extension gems. Um, and those are things, you know, these are a few of the quickies. If you can imagine, you know, sort of not having access to these, these gems, that's what we're talking about, right? That would, that would be, that would suck. And so we've got this great body of work that we want to make available. So what we've done is to make a process where all you need to do is recompile that extension 
in the, pr in the presence of Rubinius, essentially, and then we can use it. Obviously, this, we're still, this is not complete, but we're working towards that. In order to make that happen with the way that the rest of the system executes, we, we have a few little pieces. I didn't talk about this, but the garbage collector inside Rubinius is a generational garbage collector. Uh, Koichi talked about this a little bit as well, where in order to actually implement, implement it, you need to know every time an object is written to. And you have to allow, well, you don't have to, but it's pretty important that you allow for the ability to move an object. So if, you've, if an object was over here, you'd really like the ability to compact memory and to move objects around. And so the C doesn't really like that. And so what we've done is we've given, we have to add sort of an abstraction layer on top of it so the extensions can run. And that's where we get this indirection from. So that, that's a little tricky. We use a, a stack technique um, that allows us to run code actually in a different section of memory so that we can run the extensions sort of in a side, sort of by themselves, sort of segregated, and they can do whatever work they need, and they can actually contain, you know, any kind of uh, context information. They can use normal C locals and that kind of thing, and they can call back into Ruby code, and the Ruby code can return back to it, and it doesn't necessarily even know that things have happened. So that, that is a bit tricky. And one thing that, um, that we have is this ability to recover from seg faults. So obviously, you, you have to be really careful when you recover from a seg fault because you're not really sure what seg faulted, but it's, it's actually pretty cool. And this is kind of an older example, but this is an example of what I mean. We're able to do stuff like if this code up at the top obviously is gonna try and read from the address four, which is very unlikely that you're able to read that. And you get this nice memory segmentation error inside, inside Ruby land. And you know, when you're debugging your extension and you're not sure what's going on and, or why the inter interpreter just crashed, being able to have these errors that say, oh, by the way, you know, your extension test, test.c crashed here um, is actually really nice. Um, one thing that we've thought about eventually providing is the ability to have backtraces inside this code, but that's not there yet. So, you know, I, I'm, I only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna skip this section. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about performance, because it got brought up um, during Koichi's talk, specifically about Rubinius, and so thank you Koichi, for your kind words. Um, the, the, so this is sort of the reality of the situation. We're doing really well on the micro benchmarks, things like garbage collection and method dispatch. Um, I'm extremely pleased with the way that those things have been going. Uh, we've been spending time on specifically method dispatch. That's kind of the section that I talked about before. Um, we're doing okay on the macro benchmarks. We're sort of hit or miss. Um, it depends on what, what is being benchmarked. A lot of the macro benchmarks do things like they end up calling some string method that we happen to implement in a very naive way. And all of a sudden, our performance just goes through the floor. Um, so it's, it's a little bit hit or miss. And on the mega benchmarks, if you will, I would consider mega benchmarks something like uh, you know, running, running a, a large application, we're, we're pretty poor. Um, and, and I'm gonna, I'll tell you why, sort of in my solutions part. So how are we gonna make it fast? As Koichi-san said, it's a slow kind of curve as we move up. And the idea behind the projects has always been, if we, 
have put all of this pain on the, de the developers of the project. In order to make the project even decently fast, we have to make all of this Ruby code that we use as the kernel fast. That means if we can make that code the speed that 1.8 was, then you all of a sudden you've accelerated every piece of Ruby code that you, that you might be able to run. And so I think that's the big benefit there. So we've, we're sort of exploring a bunch of different options. And here's, this is just a couple. Um, we've been doing a lot of recent research into how we can use LLVM. Uh, again, Koichi talked about this in context of Yarv a little bit. Um, it gives us a, sort of a high level abstraction for the ability to j be generating machine code for Ruby methods, uh, which is obviously going to be higher performance than uh, using an interpreter. And we're looking into both the ability to do that on the fly, so that as methods, as methods are added in, we're, able, we're generating machine code. And also, sort of in, in recent days, um, the ability to do this sort of up front. So perhaps the kernel is all pre-compiled into machine code, and therefore that gives us sort of a, a leg, a temporary leg up while we are able to make the rest of the code fast. The other one that I kind of mentioned earlier is this idea of improving algorithmic performance, or efficiency here. Uh, I think that is actually going to be uh, really big. Um, th the project is largely focused on compatibility right now. Uh, we're using uh, the Ruby spec project to really get us to a level of 1.8 compatibility. And then once we're there, then we're going to start to go back and say, OK, we're complete. Let's go back and let's say, how can we make this method faster? And working on that as an algorithmic approach um, and essentially refactoring and figuring out where are the really where are the things that we're spending the most time on? How can we make those fast? And maybe that's, again, the time where perhaps we've figured out, OK, this really should, we're doing this, you know, a, you know, big O n to the 10th power craziness, right? And we can reduce it. Uh, maybe it's that we decide, OK, we really need the ability to copy data really quickly. Let's add that as a primitive. So a lot of that is going to come out of basically continuing to push on the boundaries of what we have, how we've structured that code. Um, and I want to end with um, a good quote for any project that goes on for a long period of time and doesn't necessarily seem to make a lot of progress, but you feel like it is. Um, you know, we've. The